I feel like I'm at a tutorial for which I'm <laughs> ill-prepared. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A especially warm welcome, of course, to, to Robert Harris, our guest this evening. A reviewer said of Robert's uh, Cicero trilogy, Harris has taken the DNA of Cicero's great speeches and animated them with utterly believable dialogue. <laughs> His greatest triumph is perhaps in the evocation of Roman politics, the constant bending of ancient principles before the realities of power. I would take my hat off to Harris if I hadn't already dashed it to the ground in jealous awe. <laughs> the reviewer was, of course, Boris. <laughs> Never a man to mince his words. <clears throat> Robert, you make no bones about your interest in politics. When did it all begin? Oh, um, I've been interested in politics all my life. Um, with a rather famous family story that my um, parents went when I was six years old to the parents' evening at my infant school, and everyone else had written a little piece of work about where they'd been on holiday or their pet. And I'd written a, a, a something called Why Me and My Dad Don't Like Sir Alec Douglas Hume. <laughs> <laughs> And, and in a way, I've gone on writing that ever since. Uh, indeed, I actually finally got Alec Douglas Hume as a character in my latest novel, so uh, I've really come full circle. So a, a, a lifelong interest in politics. Um, it was uh, our football, in a way, I think, at home, and my father was really fascinated by it. And so I just grew up in it, and uh, I uh, have seen it as a way, I put a lot of things of my own thoughts about it in, into these books. Cicero says at one point, his sister-in-law, I think, doesn't like politics. She thinks it's boring. And he says, boring? So the, this thing that is such a mirror to humanity that shows us at our best and our worst, the most noble and the most cowardly and deceitful. How can she call it boring? And I've always felt that. I mean, just the events of the last 24 hours here, politically. You, know? you may say whatever you like, but it's not boring. And Boris is still Foreign Secretary, is he? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, well, uh, but were there any classical influences in your youth? I mean, did you, uh, did you look at I, Claudius, or read Mary Renner, or read Ovid? Uh, Robert read uh, English at Cambridge. Did you read Ovid's Metamorphosis? Is there anything classical there? I did, um, I was, loved Rosemary Sutcliffe when I was uh, a child, the, the Eagle of the Ninth and those sorts of books. And yes, I, Claudius, uh, I did watch that and I, it was an influence, a, a brilliant piece of work, um, not least because Jack Pullman, who adapted the books, if you read the books, which are wonderful, but there's hardly any dialogue in them. They're just page after page and paragraph after paragraph. And Pullman just turned them into, you know, plays, really. And what I also admired about them was they, it seemed to me, I mean, you may correct me, but it seemed to me that Graves, as a scholar, it was accurate, actually. He dramatised it, but it was accurate. And I tried in the Cicero books to bear in mind um, that it would be useful to stick to the facts as far as possible so that someone like me, uh, at the age of 15 or 16, would, would get that sense of learning and knowing what the world was like. Uh, that, was, that was important to me. I didn't want to make things up if the reality was so much better than anything one could invent. Well, I think you're right about I Claudius. It gave a sense of that you know, desperado, mafia world. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely right. But I mean, where did, where did Pompeii come from? I mean, you know, OK, there was some classical influence, but you didn't do it at school or university, and suddenly, Bang, a Pompeii. Yes, well, it, well, it was a bit of a shock to my publishers, I have to say. <laughs> so I got three books set in the Second World War, and they were fondly expecting my next book to be set in a, a kind of futuristic America. I wanted to write a novel. Uh, I'd written Fatherland about Germany and uh, Enigma about England and Archangel about Russia, and I thought now I should write, like to write a novel about America. And uh, this is sort of 1998, 99. And uh, I hit upon what I thought was a good idea. 
uh, a novel that imagined the Walt Disney Company had taken over the world, or something rather, something rather like a nightmare dystopia. Uh, and I went to Walt Disney World. I spent about 18 months on this. And uh, I went to, but it crashed in my hands. I went to Walt Disney World and checked into the Grand Floridian Hotel. And a couple came across the lobby while I was there. And he, the man was wearing a black tuxedo with black silk Mickey Mouse ears. And <laughs> with him was a woman wearing a white silk wedding dress with white silk Mickey Mouse ears. And I said to the receptionist, what's this? And she said, oh, they're on their way to get married on the platform overlooking Sleeping Beauty's castle. <laughs> so I said, does this happen often? And she said, it happens every 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I thought at that point, there's no way that I can possibly satirise this place. <laughs> I, what, what, what feeble resources do I have? Uh, it's, it's, uh, so I returned home, and this was now the summer of 2000, and I remember very clearly sitting slightly despondent at my desk, and there was an article in the Daily Telegraph, New Research on the Destruction of Pompeii, was the headline, and I, st I just started reading the story, and it said, contrary to what we've all thought, there wasn't just some great bang, that there was, uh, you know, the eruption began at lunchtime and went on through the night into the following morning, there were warning signs before... And I suddenly thought that the ideas that I'd had about writing this novel about a kind of utopia under threat in America, I could transfer it to Rome. I could make Rome an allegory for the modern world. And, and, Ro and Pompeii could stand in for my celebration, Florida, you know, town, <laughs> modern town. And really, it was that, that was my initial thought. And then I went to Pompeii thinking that this was crazy. And actually... I, who could possibly write a novel in Tonkers and all the rest of it? It was mad. And up Pompeii, you know, the spirit of Frankie <laughs> Howard hovered over the whole thing from the start. Primus Stovus and all those characters. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I walk, it was August 2000, and I walked through the centre of Pompeii, and, uh, you know, you, that shopping street sort of thing, and then turned right and walk up the hill, and there was Vesuvius against this azure blue sky, the grey outline of Vesuvius, and the heat on my back that August day. And then I smelt water drying on stone somewhere. Uh, and I went in search of it and found where the aqueduct came into the town. And I thought, if the town lost its water supply, that would be a warning that something was going to happen. Maybe I could write a new sort of novel about Rome, about the man who ran the water in this town. Because engineers don't change, you know. The Roman engineer would have been similar to a Victorian engineer or a modern engineer. This would be something away from priests and gladiators and emperors. And that's, that's how I started. I came back, I went to the Ashmolean Library, Jasper, um, Jasper Griffin signed me in, yeah. And uh, it, was, it was just marvellous. Um, and but, the, but the actual plot itself was more than, you know, just this aqueduct folding up. I mean, there was, yeah. there were, there were, there was a villain, Ampliatus. There, there was a villain, yeah. and of course I took the names from people in the town. Ampliatus, a freed slave who obviously rose to the very rich because he paid for the uh, Temple of Isis. Uh, and his sons were on the council. Um, they, they sort of, because as a freed slave he couldn't, he wasn't a full citizen, but his sons could be. And immediately there was this... I saw that character. You know, I'm sure he wasn't an evil villain in the way that I made it. I apologise to the shade of Ampliatus. Um, but then, of course, the fact that Pliny was stationed at the end of... in, in my scene, at the end of this aqueduct and the rest of it, it was just a, a gift. It took me a long time to research it. And, and my publisher was a little bit alarmed when I said, listen, I'm going to write a novel about Pompeii. And she said, oh, my God. And I, I, we were having lunch, and a fork literally froze on the way to her mouth. And she said, who, who were the characters? And I said, uh, well, uh, Pliny the Elder. And she said, can we at least make him Pliny the Younger? <laughs> they said, no, Pliny the Elder will have to be Yes, and Ampliatus is a villain who's getting, who's paying off one of the the previous aqueduct, uh, aqueduct engineer to get cheap water for Pompeii, isn't he? In order to maintain his uh, his grip yeah. on the uh, on the uh, uh, city. I mean, that's the broad idea behind this. 
Yes, that's right. And he's he owns it's a corrupt the, world. Isn't it? Yes, and, and you know he owns the villa Hortensius, uh, Hortensia, which Hortensius had. You know where he kept the fish, and uh, so the, that gave me the opening scene where a slave gets fed to the eels, and uh, the the water is stopped flowing, and um, you know it became it's a sort of Roman techno thriller, yes. really. <laughs> and uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I, the, main, the main technical problem I had with the novel was that I couldn't, the Romans d didn't know what a volcano was. So um, uh, I had to, uh, even though it comes from Vulcan, the god, but they didn't. So I, I wrote the novel and then I thought, how do I tell people what's happening in the volcano? So what I did was I put at the beginning of each chapter a real quotation from geologists about what would be going on in the volcano at that time and what actually happened. And um, it transformed the book immediately. It casted all conversations in an ironic light, all scenes. And of course, this was like Greek tragedy. It, 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 it had had that effect of um, the volcano became like the god, yeah. and all these earth little mortals running around underneath it. Uh, it was a most marvelous experience writing that book. Yes, yeah, so I mean, that last chapter where you go into detail very accurate detail about the pyroclastic flow and all that stuff, was really absolutely <coughs> gripping. Uh, you know, a tremendous, what a cataclysm to end the novel on. And, of course, the hero does manage to get away with the girl. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's hinted that he does. <laughs> well, this lays on and, and, and another question. I mean, you cite the enormous amount of reading that you did. I think you cite 20, 26 major scholarly tomes, all... That was rife with foot and note disease, and, <laughs> and Strabo and Seneca and Pliny yes. the Elder and so on. Um, you know, digesting that would have been difficult enough. What, what, was, what, was the, what, was the, what was the thing that was most difficult in, in sort of getting a grip on the Roman world? Getting it was just doing all that reading doesn't give you a real sense of it. It's the thing that, that, that really allowed, allowed you to get a grip on the Roman world, or you found you really got there. Well, I went and spent a lot of time there. I, I love uh, in all my books to have a sense of place and geography. I like where people would sit and walk and what it smelt like and what the, you know, the terrain. And, and I love constructing a world, the, the fatherland or the huts at Bletchley Park. Or it was wonderful in this new novel, Munich, to go around Downing Street after hours and to go to where the conference took place into Hitler's apartment. Uh, so, so that was important to me, and I, I went several times in the spring, or you know, around January, February time, when it's deserted. It's the most haunting place. Anyone who's <coughs> never been to Pompeii, it's uh, it's one of those places you go, and it does subtly change you. I think in some way, it's so atmospheric. So that was quite important, and that's you know, just so I could see whose house was where, and you know, the people begin to come alive in your mind. Um, I think that, that that was important, and the aqueduct itself, the root of it, and um, the technology of it. Um, and I just love the sense of this. I mean, I became obsessed with strange things, like um, the hydraulic cement. Um, there's a most extraordinary book about it by um, an American civil engineer who was being dragged, retired, and was being dragged around Europe by his wife. And Finally, he found himself stuck in Rome, <laughs> seeing all these wretched art treasures. And then they went into the Pantheon. And uh, he looked up at the dome. And he looked up again. And then he said, we couldn't build this today. Uh, and he, it, he started to try and work out how the Romans had done it. And we still don't really know, except that they, the, the way that they pounded this, this cement on the, on, the, on the Bay of Naples, at Portioli, uh, changed, they pounded it so hard and made, made the cement so dry uh, that it altered the molecular structure uh, in a way that they didn't do again until the 20th century when they developed something called Candex to build the Hoover Dam. So the Roman technology 2,000 years ago, it, it, it took us all that time to, re to, to, to discover it again. Those sorts of details. Uh, I think it's important to have a sense of reverence for the past, not to mock it, not to think you're superior to it. One of the great things about writing about the ancient world is I don't think one feels ever superior to that world. 
it's superior to ours in many ways. Yes, I thought what was so interesting about <coughs> Pompeii was that, that the hero is, is an engineer. You know, he's not a consul, he's not a rich person, he's an engineer. And these sort of are the unspoken heroes, in a sense, of the Roman world. I mean, Frontinus, the bloke who ran the aqueducts, who looked after the aqueducts of Rome for 15, 20 years, um, uh, said, look at all the pyramids, look at all the wonderful Greek temples. Yes, they're marvellous, but none of them are a patch on Roman aqueducts. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a, it was a clue to, to make an engineer the hero of this particular story. It's not sort of what you expect, would you expect in a Roman novel. Yes, no, it really worked. I remember it got a great review in the uh, New York Times book review. In fact, it was on the cover of the only time I ever had this. It was the cover with an illustration. And the headline was, uh, Roman art, question mark, no, Harris is more interested than plumbing. <laughs> 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 and the illustration was in a sort of man in a toga bending over a manhole cover. <laughs> uh, but it's true. And, you know, every generation reinterprets the ancient world. I mean... Um, Buller Lytton, his book about Pompeii, The Last Days of Pompeii, was the greatest bestseller of the 19th century. It, uh, it went into 34, 35 editions. There were three, four stage versions running at the time. <coughs> well, he's only interested in Christianity and paganism and so on. Um, it's our generation, you know, that are more interested in the threat of nature and um, our... Our, an engineering and um, similarly with Pompeii what was so strange is that no one had ever asked before why it was that all the bodies were found eight feet above the ground every skeleton was eight feet above street level but literally no one as, I, as far as I understand it had ever said well how could that be I mean how did everyone and only, uh, only in the, after the eruption of Mount St Helens did we understand about pyroclastic flows and that the city would slowly <coughs> fill up with pumice, which is the, the new research that, that was referred to in that Telegraph article. Well, this bull would live in the success <coughs> of Pompeii. Let's turn to the Cicero Treaty. Now, Cicero, we're going to have some Latin now, so get a grip. Um, <laughs> Cicero asked what history would make of, of his times in 600 years. And then he went on to say, I fear history's verdict uh, much more than the, than the uh, tittle-tattle of, of our contemporary world, said Cicero. Quid vero historiae de nobis ad annos DC, or sesquentos, praedicarant? Quas quidem ego multo magis verium, quam eorum hominum qui hodie we want rumusculos. Rumusculos, the little rumours, the tittle-tattle. Now, everyone says Latin is such an economic language. Hmm, maybe not. Contemporary rumours, we would translate it. Latin for contemporary, eorum hominum qui hodie we would. <laughs> the men who live today. English could be pretty economical as well. So, I mean, what drew you to Cicero? I mean, Shakespeare didn't make much of him. The formidable German classicist Theodore Mommsen of the 19th century... <laughs> accused him of just being a newspaper journalist. <laughs> uh, Schoolboys reading Cicero's speeches. Well, oh, come on, pull me up. So what was with Cicero? Well, I'd earned my living after the, my early brush with Sir Alec Douglas Hume as a political journalist. Uh, I was political editor of The Observer, and then I wrote a political column for The Sunday Times. And uh, uh, I'd always wanted to write a political novel but I'd been put off, um, really, on the, on the white silk Mickey Mouse ears principle, that there was nothing I could write about an invented politician which would be more absurd and outlandish than the ones that actually existed. Uh, why invent a president when, at that time, you had George Bush, or uh, a prime minister when one had Tony Blair or Berlusconi? And, uh, so I sort of, and I didn't like novels that had, you know, the scheming chief whip and the affair with the undersecretary of agriculture and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so, and it, would, it just seemed earthbound. But then I'd so enjoyed writing Pompeii that just as I finished it, I would send a proof copy of Tom Holland's book Rubicon, and, uh, which I read and thoroughly enjoyed. And 
I suddenly thought, my God, look, here, at one time, possibly even in the same room, you could have had Cicero, Cato, Caesar, Pompey, Crassus, Clodius, all of them. And this is the most extraordinary galaxy of political talent until perhaps the uh, American Revolution. <coughs> and uh, I thought, they would write a political novel about this. Use these people. And also, as I had with the aqueducts uh, with Pompeii, um, how did the pol political mechanism of Rome work? Because most people had done gladiators and emperors and so on, but in the Republic, how did it function? How did you stand for office? What was the process? How often were the elections? Uh, how did you speak to, an, uh, to 600 senators? How did you speak to two or 3,000 in the forum without benefit of amplification? How did the whole thing, the law, and it all work together? So I set out to, to do that. And the moment I set out on that road, then Cicero became the obvious character to put at the centre of it. Because in many ways he was the f almost the first professional politician who, who approached it uh, um, with a deliberate aim to achieve political glory, not on the battlefield, uh, not through inherited wealth, but purely by writing through the law courts. And uh, um, that made him a modern figure. Um, and, and so I started work. And really, for two years, I did nothing but research. Until, in the end, or the, the trilogy itself it runs to about 400,000 words, the three volumes. But the notes for it run to over 600,000 words. <laughs> All of them typed in. Because for me, the lived experience of writing a novel I, has to be the research. I've never employed a researcher. I do it all myself. And so a lot of the things I don't ever put in the book, but I know them all, you know what I mean? I've processed them all. Um, and it's time consuming, but it's in those connections then that you start to see how the whole book can work. Well, this, this immediately segues uh, effortlessly onto another big question about the, you know, what's your handle on historical fiction? Now, uh, Hilary Mantel, as you know, is just given her, her, her recent lectures on, on this uh, very issue. Um, and uh, just to make one or two, uh, to report one or two comments for, of, of, of Mantel on this particular subject. Writers shouldn't claim they're doing research when they mean they are skimming facts out of pre-existing texts. Unless they're also trained historians, novelists mostly don't have the skills for original research from primary sources. On the one hand, and then she also says, the novelist is after a type of knowledge that goes beyond the academic. Now, where do you stand in, in, in that? Well, um, I don't know where she would have got the information to write Wolf Hall if she hasn't read academic books. So, um, I mean, I disagree with her. She, she never cites or acknowledges historians, other works. Uh, in her books as if everything had come out of her head, the acting restraint of Annates and the, or the whatever. Well, obviously, this isn't the case. So I, I, I've always been careful to cite historians and scholars whose work I've used um, because I think that's only fair and proper uh, and also because I hope that those books might, you know, readers might then go on to read the sources that I have used. Um, I have done original research for novels in archives, uh, Enigma in particular. I read all the intercepts and so on at the public record office that are in that book. I interviewed code breakers, Alan Turing's fiance, for instance, people now dead, uh, Stuart Milner Barry uh, and uh, Harry Hinsley. Uh, so I, I did do primary research for that book. <coughs> uh, I think that the, the function of... Uh, of a historical novelist is to go to places that a scholar cannot, that they are barred from entering realms of speculation, uh, imaginary conversations, uh, domestic details. I mean, the job of, his, of a, of a, uh, a fiction writer, you can switch on lights, batteries of searchlights of imagination that, that are not available to a scholar. But I would never, ever belittle scholarship because without that 
I wouldn't be able to, to write the book in the first place. Well, I, th I think, to my way of thinking, it's the particularity of, of a moment that, that brings history to, to life. And I think it's your capacity to particularise these conversations, these moments, these issues, because A, you've done the work, and B, you've brought this in wonderfully inventive imagination to it that actually makes it come, come alive. So I, th I think your work is... There's a sense in which your work is academic, which leads on to the next obvious question. How did <coughs> academe respond to it? I mean, I mean, all academics, especially classicists, we're, we're very jealous of our little patch. <laughs> and there are the tiger sharks slowly circling, looking for whom they may disembowel. <laughs> uh, uh, well, did, they, did they greet your work um, favourably on the whole? Uh, on the whole, yes, actually. Um, we're all gathered here uh, uh, because we have a passion for the classics and believe it's important in our civilization and culture, perhaps as never before, uh, that we remind ourselves about what happened in the past and also open up that treasure of, of the literature and the history and the architecture and all the rest of it of that period. Uh, but it's a, it's a battle, hence the fact that it has to be a, a charity here doing what it, you would have hoped actually the government would do, but you know we have to do it. Uh, and therefore, most academics are only too pleased that one is popularising the subject or doing something to help bring people into it. So on the whole, the response has been generous. Uh, there have been one or two uh, carping critics who, see, you know, who seem to think that I'm you know, trying to write um, scholarly works. Well, of course I'm not. I'm writing for uh, a large audience. I'm not dumbing down the books. I write the books, that could te as you say, could technically detailed books. But nevertheless, uh, they, they reach a large audience, and most academics seem uh, pleased by that. Yeah, good, excellent. Um, Tom Holland, one of our patrons, uh, reviewed um, uh, the Cicero, one of the books in the Cicero Trilogy and made the point that you made earlier on. Uh, that uh, Cicero, unlike the aristocrats who customarily secured power in the Republic, Cicero was a parvenu, with no family tradition of imperium to draw upon and few other resources save for the spellbinding power of his oratory. Well, this is a question that is always raised about Cicero. Is rhetoric dead? Well, Ciceronian-style rhetoric is dead. That was the main means of political communication to the masses in the ancient world. Where are we now? What sort, of, what sort of persuasive powers are open to us now? What sort of persuasion is, is, is there among <coughs> our politicians these days? Well, normally, to be honest, I, take, I, don't, I don't like this view that things were so much better years ago. You know? I think it's, it's, a, it's a besetting kind of sin uh, to think that. But on the issue of political debate, and its standard and oratory, I think it's uncontestable uh, that we're living in a terrible era of uh, political discourse. I mean, you know, just, I'm sorry to keep mentioning Munich, I only mention it because it's in my mind, but the Times reports on the debates in Parliament would be two full pages of a big newspaper, thin columns, no pictures, you know, the full debate is there. I mean, you know, we just don't have that anymore. We don't, we, don't, we don't debate things in that detail. I mean, the more one looks back at that referendum on Europe, whether, whichever side, I'm not making a point of about who won, but the standard of debate, the quality of knowledge imparted to people, how well informed people were, is, was pretty pitiful when you look back on it. And uh, the, the great days of speeches in the House of Commons when people would hurry in to hear foot or being on power or you know anyone like that, those have gone as far as I can see, and uh, you know, and I don't think we're better off for it, uh, in in my view. I mean, you can argue the other way that you had this great glittering array of talent in the Senate, Caesar, Cicero, Cato, and all the rest of it, and what did they do? The, they blew the place up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so you know, I, I mean, I can see you can you can argue it the other way, but. Uh, I mean, those speeches of Cicero's are, they're masterpieces. I mean, and they're funny still, and they're still moving, and they're still sharp and brilliant and clever, 
and you can see the tricks he uses. Um, I mean, it was a delight to go through them all. Um, and I, 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 one of the things that I did realize was when I came to the Philippics in the final volume was how much Churchill must have drawn on Cicero uh, in, in 1940, because the speeches that uh, were made by Cicero against Mark Antony, we mustn't even talk peace terms with him. Uh, 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 and then at one point Cicero actually says, um, if the Roman Republic is to end, let it end when we're, we're all of us is lying choking on the ground in our own blood. <laughs> well, those exact words were used by Churchill to the cabinet soon after he took power in 1940. So uh, when people say, who was Cicero like? I think he was very much like Churchill. With, he obviously, he wasn't fascinated by war in the way that Churchill was. But he, he was a similar sort of character. Witty, people collected his jokes. Uh, he was a life enhancer. He was vain and he was often wrong and so on. But people like, sort of liked hanging around him. Yeah. Uh, and, I think he, and he also had this relentless work ethic. I mean, that he would pack in two days into normal, two working days into one. I, I, I hope you'll indulge me. I must uh, tell a, a personal reminiscence of Enoch Powell as an example of ancient rhetoric. Uh, in 1989, Kenneth Baker's national curriculum threatened to destroy the teaching of classics in state schools. And we invited Enoch, after he lost his seat in South Down, to come up to Newcastle University, where, where I was teaching, uh, to talk about the national curriculum. And in the car, we picked him up in Chester Street and drove him along. In the car, I said to, I said to Enoch, um, we're, we're trying to persuade MPs to, to, to help us. H how should we set about doing this? And, and I, word for word, this is the virtue of great rhetoric. His reply, he turned to me with his cold blue eyes, etc., etc., etc. And he said, Never write to MPs on headed notepaper. <laughs> there are no votes in headed notepaper. <laughs> Never write to MPs from business addresses. There are no votes in business addresses. Never write to MPs on IBM typewriters. There are no votes in IBM typewriters. Now, there we have the tricolon, the three legs with, with, with repetition and one. There was then a pause, and he said, letters MPs fear more than any other are written in biro, on blue-lined notepaper, <laughs> with no margins. <laughs> so how not to do it, how to do it, with a little triplet at the end. And then the conclusion, in such letters are there votes. <laughs> a, 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 a triplet again, a large, a large, how not to do it, how to do it, and the reason why. And that just came out just like that. <laughs> Quite extraordinary and utterly memorable. My uh, favourite line of this was when he was asked how he, how he wanted his hair cut by the hairdresser. He said, in silence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a joke, I have to say, first found in Plutarch, <laughs> second century AD. <laughs> Um, now, now, Robert, we're, 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 to serious scholarly matters. Uh, when Caesar was stabbed to death, um, we all know uh, what he said uh, as almost his last words, et tu, Brute, as Marcus Brutus came up and stabbed him. Yet, in dictator, we were all outraged when Cicero's words were the equivalent of et tu, Decimus, or decimus. <coughs> it's decimus, Brutus, who stabs him to death, and not Marcus. Come on, Robert, what's going on? Uh, well, um, I think that it's nice to do a, a, a slightly different twist on very familiar scenes. And um, the, it, I was worried about writing the assassination of Caesar, given it's such a familiar uh, episode. Uh, but to tell it from... Cicero's point of view in the audience, and the throne carried in, taken out again, and so on. 
Um, I mean, let's face it, Caesar almost certainly didn't say anything at all. If you're stabbed 32 times, or whatever, <laughs> I mean, you're not making a lot of sense, uh, and particularly getting the right name and so on and so forth. What is, what is the case uh, is that the, I don't think, having worked my way through it, I don't think of the, it, the presence of the famous Brutus would be the one that shocked him in The Assassins. He would probably have expected it. If he was, anyone was going to stab him, it would be him. Uh, what would have shocked him completely is this almost adopted son, Decimus, who, who had built the fleet that invaded Britain and conquered Brittany, and who, he'd, he, and who he actually left money to, probably to, in his will. And he was the man who, when Caesar refused to come to, to the Senate, when was sent by the conspirators to say, come on, you've got to come, because otherwise people are going to say you're ill, and so on. So he persuaded him to come. So if he was going to say, and I don't think he said it to anybody, but if he was going to say, if he was going to be outraged to anyone, it would have been to that Brutus rather than the other Brutus, in my view, yeah. Professor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A sticky moment. <laughs> this, I'd had a nightmare that I'd be sitting here and it would turn into a kind of viva. <laughs> yes, yes, well, all right, Harris, yes. <laughs> um, could you say something, we're coming to the end of our time, alas, uh, could you say something about the RSC uh, performance of Cicero? As you know, Cicero is, 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 is now going to be a play at the RSC, opening in December. Could you say yeah. something about it? Well, not just one play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, well, it's about two years ago that Greg Doran, the uh, artistic director of the RSC, got in touch with me and said uh, that he wanted... They were doing a Rome season in 2017, and he wanted to do the Catiline Conspiracy. Uh, but the Ben Johnson play was un performable, you know, in any way. There's a Cicero speech that lasts 22 minutes, he said, in a, and it's just, it was completely impossible. So he said, but I, and I, but I like your books, and do you think we could do what we did with Wolf Hall and, and adapt it for the stage? So, of course, I pretend it played hard to get, not, <laughs> not for a second. Uh, and, uh, and he said, do you want to do it? And, and I very wisely said, no, I don't think I can because I, I wanted to write Conclave and Dictator. So uh, uh, Mike Poulton, who had already met, who adapted Wolf Hall, came, came on board. And uh, so then it was a matter of how did one turn this 400,000 words into anything that would work on the stage. And eventually, although the, the, the double bill is called Imperium, actually it really starts with Lustrum and with, with Cicero becoming consul. And I think Mike's done a, a brilliant job of... Uh, of of, of tracing the arc of, of uh, Cicero's career. And really the two plays cover the, last, the second two books. Um, and Greg had a very good idea, because the material is so huge and intractable, of, of making really each evening three plays, three one-hour plays. So, it's, so the first one is uh, Cicero, uh, then Catiline, and then Clodius. That's the first evening. And then the second one is Caesar, uh, Mark Antony, Octavius. So, so each play is grouped around that figure in Cicero's life. Um, and, you know, I, I hope it's going to be great. The, the, they've taken up the stage, taken out the stage of the Swan Theatre uh, and are making it so the audience is as if they're in the forum. And the, 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 the floor lifts and people enter up staircases and uh, I mean I think it will uh, it's, it's the most revolutionary staging they've done at the RSC so it's it's very thrilling and I you know I, it's it's wonderful to see you know your work uh, take on this other form I mean it's likely and hopefully that also it will be a, a, an I Claudius like TV series so that's also the first episode of that has been written so Cicero having been rubbished by Momsen and ignored <laughs> by Shakespeare, uh, I hope will finally take his place because uh, I, I see he and Caesar as the two great Romans, one of whom conquered the West, as Momsen said, took France and Britain into the orbit of, of Rome, and as Britain then took America as well, so the world was changed by Caesar and his conquest. 
And, and Cicero really provided the literature and the philosophy, and really the discovery of his letters kick-started the Renaissance. So the, the, it's good that to try to do something to restore Cicero in popular culture, good. which well, had been so dominated by Caesar. Yes, good. Give us, a, give us a, if you were running classes for all, what would be your, what would be as it were your strap line? What, 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 what would you say to get all the schools rushing to study the ancient world? Um, well, I wanted, to, I'd probably say uh, sex, violence. Oh. Uh, no, not, not now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favourite, uh, let me put it this way. We were talking earlier about Shackleton Bailey's uh, edition of um, Cicero's Letters, which is, which is so brilliant. But the, he wrote a biography of Cicero, which has the most brilliant ending. Uh, where he says it's, we should understand the Cicero in the letters, this life-enhancing figure uh, who enraptured his own generation and can do so for hours for anyone who's willing to spare the time to read his letters and to discover the Romans, uh, Virgil's togged people, desperate masters of a larger world. And I, those are those, the desperate masters of a larger world, I think, is the most perfect summation of the Romans. Right, one more question. I keep is trying to end on a high note, <laughs> and then we have to go back. <laughs> oh, no, no, this, is a, this, this is a high note for us, uh, um, Is there a twinkle in your eye on the matter of perhaps another Roman novel? Well, I do have an idea, oddly enough, but I'm going to keep it firmly to myself. Um, and uh, uh, yes, no, I would love to go back to that world at some point. Uh, it's been uh, been the greatest pleasure of my uh, writing life. I think writing about the Romans. Wonderful. Thank you. Now we are we are going to have uh, uh, ten minutes or so for audience questions. Two people at the front here. Good evening, gentlemen. Professor. Professor. Um, there's a sense of elegiac lament for Roman democracy. Uh, your description of the, the actual methods they used uh, to count the votes, uh, I, could, I could sense a real sense of, of um, lament there for the passing of, of the, uh, the old Republican democratic system in favor of this uh, imperial system that came. Uh, were you as... as um, did you feel as strongly as, as we, uh, some of us read it, this, this elegiac quality, this lament for democracy? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I, uh, it was an incredible thing, that Roman Republic. I mean, there were, there were obviously huge flaws in it. Women couldn't vote, slaves obviously couldn't vote. Uh, most people, in fact, there were, in theory, I think about a million electors when Cicero was running for consul, but only, only those that could actually get there and vote in the course of the day could vote, and it was weighted in favour of the wealthy. Their votes counted for more. Nevertheless, it must have been the most extraordinary sight, and the checks and balances, the divisions of power, the, the, the access of ordinary people to their rulers, to, 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 to be canvassed, to, uh, to watch the laws being made, and so on, um, it, it is in some ways a more vibrant democracy than our own. Um, a, a, a mechanism of enormous sophistication. And I did share Cicero's lament for, for the passing of this wondrous thing which had grown up over centuries. And there were moments when I was writing the book when it seemed that the West was in a very settled state. I mean, I started the book, what, in 2003? Um, and uh, finished it in 2013, 14, whenever it was, I can't remember, but uh, 16. It was a period of stability in the West, and sometimes I did wonder why I was writing the books. But now when I look back on it, it was as if I'm, there was something in the air um, that one had sensed. And really, what are the books about? They're about unscrupulous billionaires, by that standard of the time, whipping up the people against the elite um, and doing it for their own ends of power and the system cracking and breaking and and in the end 
the money that flooded into the system and the sense that there was no longer a feeling of what the Republic was really for anymore. Uh, and I, I do think that the Roman Republic and its fall stands as a warning to, to, to every democracy uh, how fragile the actual structure can be because the, it would have seemed inconceivable to Cicero at the beginning of his career that by the end of it the whole thing would have been lying rubble. Um, can I just pick up the question you were asked about the decline of political discourse? And maybe I'll answer the, the question you also asked about sex violence and I'd say persuasion, maybe. Because I think, for me, that's one of the things that perhaps Classic Sprawl needs to sort of yes. help to evangelise, which is, in this era of sort of, what was it today? I think Collins have announced fake news. It's the word of the year. So for me, understanding Cicero and rhetoric is actually about encouraging democracy, encouraging people to understand the powers of persuasion in this era of sort of mass media and advertising. So do you think that's also one of the areas perhaps that could be brought up? I, I do, I agree. Um, I think what is frightening about social media is the way that everyone retreats into their own zone and only follows and listens to the, the, the news and the gets the information that confirms their existing prejudices. And, uh, um, of course, to, all, to a degree, everybody has always been born one way or the other in terms of their political views and may evolve over time, but uh, they very often don't change them, most people, in the course of a campaign or a speech. But, but the essence of democracy must be that persuasion is possible. Otherwise, it's a meaningless exercise. And uh, the essence of Cicero's life, ceaselessly, was to persuade. Uh, that, that was what he did morning, noon and night. And of course he wouldn't persuade everyone, but maybe you could persuade the 10-20% in the middle by force of reason and argument. And I do share your uh, worry that that is what we have lost. And now that it doesn't matter um, what people say or do, um, they are so cynical they, and they are so they've swallowed so much, as you say, fake news or conspiracy theories or whatever, and their prejudice are, prejudices are immovable. Yes, indeed. The ancients thought in terms of getting their own way by three different means, which they generalised as force, deceit, and persuasion, by which they meant reason and logic. And we all know which is the most successful uh, and alas, the other two tend to be wielded too readily these days. I think we have time for one more. Uh, thank you very much indeed. But just following on for actually from the last question, I just wonder if you're a bit unfair about to Parliament. Um, in the middle of last night, I couldn't sleep. So as is my want, I, I turned on to the parliamentary channel, which usually does the trick. <laughs> and, and I was in the middle of a House of Lords debate in the middle of a speech by Lord Judge, of whom I was, I must confess, ignorant, who was a very distinguished lawyer. And they were debating, not exactly the sexiest subject, but it was the money laundering bill. And I was absolutely spellbound. Here was a distinguished advocate, without a note, going through this bill forensically, highly amusingly, both to his colleagues and indeed in the chamber. And actually, for a moment, actually gave me hope that actually when people like Lord Judge get to grips with the Great Repeal Bill, as that bill is misnamed, because we don't know how great it is, except large and long, uh, that actually there is some hope for this country. When people like him in the Second Chamber actually get to grips uh, with that, I think Cicero would have approved of his speech. Yes, although Cicero would have wanted to be on BBC One at prime time <laughs> for, at least, for at least three hours. Uh, and, in a sense, although I agree with what you say, the context in which you frame the anecdote uh, proves the other case, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and that, uh, uh, I mean, the media, it, it, politics has followed the, the, the media, uh, and, and now it's become trench warfare, and really the media fall upon any, when the best, as you know, the definition is a, of a gaffe is when a politician blurts out the truth. Uh, and it is invariably the case. And, and politics is just now all about defensive, not saying too much, or repeating the same thing again and again and again. Uh, we saw that in the last election in a way that was just unbelievable in a democracy, actually. Uh, so I'm, I'm afraid I, 
I'm glad that it's there on the parliamentary channel at midnight, but it's and in the second chamber and not elected. But it's not really, <laughs> you know, the heart of the beast, is it? And uh, that is, uh, I think, quite uh, frightening. Um, well, anyway, I don't want to end on a on a downbeat note, but I've forgotten all my upbeat endings. Now, so. <laughs> I, I think we've had plenty of upbeat endings there. Uh, I think we must wrap up now. Robert, thank you so much for thank supporting you. Classics for All this year and season. <laughs> you've given us a fascinating insight into uh, everything you've put into uh, what we all hope will turn out to have been his first four Roman novels. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> It's a wrap.